talking about trauma assessment, and she's back today talking about trauma treatment. She's going to focus on the core components of effective trauma treatment for children and adolescents. Dr. Meeker is a certified disaster mental health trainer through the New York State of Office of Mental Health and a licensed clinical psychologist with a private clinical practice specializing in children and adolescents among a whole bunch of other work that she does. She's going to introduce herself even more. Dr. Meeker, thank you so much for being with us today. I just want to let the audience know that there's a chat box to the right. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please chat them in the chat box, and we will um, attend to them as the best we can. Thanks so much for being with us today, and thanks again to you, Dr. Meeker, for presenting for us. Thank you, Kara, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, back and doing another webinar on trauma for CTAC. Um, I've been working in the area of trauma for almost 12 years, both at the system level, um, primarily in Monroe County, and working with our system partners, and as well as the individual practice level um, in my private practice, where I work with children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, so through my work, I've been really fortunate to be exposed to and trained in different evidence-based practices as well as trauma-informed care. Um, but my best teachers um, have always been the youth and the families with whom I've been privileged to work. And so throughout the presentation, I'll be sharing some of those experiences uh, with you. So our agenda today um, is to first uh, look at the phases of uh, treatment and kind of looking across different evidence-based practices, what are some of the common uh, phases that we find. Um, as you've probably been exposed to different trauma treatment approaches such as trauma-focused CBT or trauma systems therapy or the ARC model, um, you've probably noted while there's some differences, there are definitely similarities in terms of effective treatment components. So we're going to go deeper into what those components are um, and uh, then be able to finally wrap it up by how you put it all together. How do you take your understanding of those different phases um, and those essential elements? So looking at, you know, when would you know to transition and uh, introduce kind of the next phase of treatment? Uh, how do you know that a child's uh, ready to take on that? Um, when is, you know, when are you ready for discharge? So we'll be looking at that as we uh, go forward this afternoon. So for me, working with each new youth and family is like embarking on a journey. So the common element oftentimes is that there's been some type of exposure to trauma, but the journey for each individual is unique based on uh, his or her prior experience, the, their strengths, uh, the supports that the family has, and the nature of the trauma itself. So over the years, I've built and strengthened my understanding of trauma, um, its impact, its impact on the brain, and what are uh, effective treatments for trauma. So this is what I'm packing and bringing on this journey. Um, the youth and family, of course, are bringing their own expertise, so what works for them, what their goals are, and effective treatment needs to honor and recognize what everyone's bringing to the table. Um, so while there's, effect, there's phases and effective components, um, may, you know, they're going to be the same, but just how long one child stays in one phase or cycles back through a phase and um, which components are going to be the most effective for that particular child will vary. So each journey is going to be unique. And I think this is important because sometimes when people think about evidence-based practices, they kind of think, oh, it kind of feels like a cookie-cutter model. But really, the evidence-based practice is your map, and everyone's, you know, kind of uh, path to get to that final destination may look a little bit different. So uh, here is kind of an overview of the phases of treatment that we're going to talk about. And um, you can see there are certain phases that are present from kind of the get-go, day one, that carry through um, treatment, and some uh, kind of get phased in along the way. So um, everything starts with engagement, as it does for any type of treatment. Um, this is particularly important for trauma survivors, where trust, understandably, is such a core feature. Um, and as we all know, without engagement, there really is no treatment that can uh, happen. 
and as trust is being built, we you know, start into our assessment. And um, again, a good thorough assessment is essential because that's going to really guide the treatment and ensure that treatment is going to be customized to meet the needs of that particular child and family. Psychoeducation is also ongoing, um, so that includes uh, not only providing psychoeducation to the child and family, but other collaterals as well. You know, the children spend a lot of time at school, they're in other environments, so other people in the child's life uh, may need some additional education. So once the foundation of treatment is established, then you can move into what might be considered the more active phases of treatment, um, including skill development, uh, trauma processing, and building resilience. And as you can see, these phases will overlap and um, kind of ongoing assessment is going to help you with the pacing. And you know, for a visual representation, this is obviously looks very lineal, but we know that things can be more cyclical depending on kind of uh, where a child and family is uh, at. So starting with engagement, um, you know, some of this uh, on this slide might look familiar uh, to you. It comes uh, a lot of it out of Mary McKay's work. Um, engagement starts what we, we know with the very first contact with any agency or provider. Um, and so it's that initial phone call, um, any correspondence, the actual physical um, environment, the emotional tone of the clinic. And um, remember, all of that happens prior to a child and family meeting with a therapist. So one thing I always say is that you can be the best therapist in town providing the most effective trauma treatment, but unless the practices surrounding you are trauma-informed, that trauma survivor may never even get to you. So if they get turned off by that initial phone call or they get overwhelmed by the paperwork, um, you know, they may never get to your treatment because they get um, discouraged by uh, their contact. So trauma-informed you know, practices are essential, and so those trauma-specific treatments need to be embedded in that type of environment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, engagement is based on building trust, and uh, so this can be accomplished in several ways, um, starting with orienting a child and family to the therapy process, which could be unfamiliar to them. Um, attending to practical concerns, so, you know, if they're having housing issues or they don't have warm clothing for the winter, um, that's going to be more pressing than kind of uh, engaging uh, in this therapeutic process. And so they might, those things might need to be attended to um, before anything else can happen. Um, and uh, also addressing and problem solving around any barriers. So some of those barriers might be very practical um, around transportation. Other things may be uh, related to negative prior experiences with the system. Um, so this is important because if a family has felt kind of uh, traumatized or re-traumatized by the system, they're going to be wary coming into this relationship. So I always recommend um, putting the trust issue right on the table and making sure to recognize uh, the courage that it takes uh, for the child and family to share personal information, especially with someone who initially is a stranger, and really acknowledge that trust is going to occur over time and that you don't expect it right from the get-go, um, and that as the relationship builds, um, you know, hopefully they'll feel more comfortable to share uh, additional information that they might not feel comfortable sharing initially. Um, the concept of attunement is also important, and this is both the verbal and uh, nonverbal communication from the therapist that lets the child know that uh, he or she has actually been heard. Um, so this is more than active listening, which is also important, but also entails understanding and responding to other communication, so primarily thinking about behavior, which may be conveying a lot more than what's being verbally said. So given that, um, given that trauma survivors um, oftentimes feel very misunderstood and judged by others, uh, using attunement you know, helps to foster that sense that they are being understood and accepted without judgment. 
So um, when it comes to the initial presentation and referral, what's often the focus of concern are the big behaviors. So the child is acting out, they're cutting, they're using drugs or alcohol, maybe they're being defiant, refusing to go to school, um, which we know is the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, you see these different kind of diagnoses on the top of this iceberg here, and so those Pre that initial presentation might lead to diagnoses. Maybe they've come in already having these diagnoses of conduct disorder, of oppositional defiant disorder, depression, attention deficit. But we know when there's been trauma, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Um, so these are the behaviors that often get the attention of adults and are certainly of concern. But really, your job is to be able to go below the uh, surface. So I'm oh, clicking here. There. There's our little submarine, okay? So to go below the surface and be able to take a look um, as what has happened to this child and why he or she uh, may be acting this way. So uh, that leads into our comprehensive assessment. Um, and, you know, this is what gives you your initial picture of the child and family, what's happened, current concerns, what their strengths are, areas of challenges, and allows you to work with the child and family to craft a treatment approach that's going to be most effective for them. Um, so, uh, Kara did mention that I previously did a presentation on trauma assessment, which I believe is available on the CTAC website. So, um, I refer you to that to kind of get more detailed information. But, um, you know, in general, looking at assessment tools, there's a lot of questionnaires that are out there, and they generally fall into three categories, those that look at trauma exposure, those that look at trauma exposure and symptoms, and those that are focused more on the trauma symptoms. So um, at the end of the present, this presentation, there are some links to online resources um, that have nice comprehensive reviews of uh, the different tools and measures and what ages they're for and how to get them. So um, I encourage you to explore that information. Um, it's important that your assessment approach not only includes measures, um, but also obviously uh, interviews with the child and family, observation of the child, um, their interaction with their family, and contact with collaterals. Um, also, if you're using measures, I do encourage you to include a measure on resiliency because sometimes we focus so much on kind of what are the um, areas of challenge, what are the symptoms, that we forget to look at the opposite um, end and really identifying what the strengths are. And that's going to help in terms of when you start to look at where are the needs in terms of skill development, what are you building upon. Um, as in any assessment, you want to collect information also about the child, the family history. So is this a family where there's been generational trauma? Is this um, kind of a new type of event uh, that they're dealing with um, and had been pretty stable up until now? Also the child's developmental history, again, has there been uh, prior uh, kind of concerns developmentally up until this point? So really having that good full understanding. Um, I also want to highlight the importance of assessing the client and environmental stability. Um, if the client is unstable, so if they're at risk of hurting themselves or someone else, obviously that needs to be addressed before um, diving into trauma treatment. You also need a good understanding of the current environment. Um, so if there's concerns about safety, and physical safety or emotional safety, that obviously needs to be addressed first. So um, sometimes it might rise to a level where there might be need to be child um, protective involvement, but other times it might just be that um, really the type of support that's needed to be able to engage fully in trauma processing isn't there for that child. It wouldn't be um, in their best interest to kind of unpack that trauma because they don't have the emotional support around them to do that work at this present moment in time. So in that case, treatment may focus more on skill development and building resiliency versus to unpack, unpackage that trauma history. Um, and then as you can see, trauma you know, assessment isn't a one-time event. This is ongoing, and we'll be talking about this as we uh, progress into the presentation. Here's an example of a scale that you can use, a child uh, PTSD symptom scale. This has uh, been designed for uh, children between the ages of 8 and 18, and it looks both at trauma symptoms as well as daily functioning. Um, so they focus kind of on the last two weeks and have them rate how frequently uh, these symptoms are occurring. 
Um, so some of the strengths of this scale is that it is uh, kind of focusing on those uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms that are in the DSM. And um, also because it uses this scale, you, it's not just dichotomous, yes, this is happening or no, it's not, but it also um, looks at the frequency. Um, it also, as I mentioned, looks at functional impairment. So are there areas that are being impaired at home, friends, school, other areas of the child's life? Another nice bonus is that this measure is free. It's easily um, available and can be administered in about 15 minutes and scored in about five. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a good resource that uh, can be easily implemented. One thing to be aware of uh, is that some feedback has been that the language isn't developmentally appropriate. So it, it's rated to be used from 8 to 18, but the reading level is about an 8th grade reading level. So cert some children may need assistance in completing it. Um, I just wanted to offer another way to kind of do that assessment. This is an example of a timeline that was completed by a 14-year-old girl who I was working with whose mother uh, abandoned her when she was um, under the age of one. And kind of the ripple effect of that is now she was being raised by a single parent and her father had to move frequently for the type of work that he did. Um, so I find the timeline a really helpful tool, tool during the assessment process for a number of reasons. First, I always get additional information um, other than what I get from kind of the standard interview, questions this, uh, that I never even thought to ask. Um, so it's really helpful in that way. You know, you might find out about um, people in their lives that are important or other events. Um, the other thing is I consistently get feedback from youth that this is an helpful exercise for them. Um, it may be the first time they ever kind of laid out sequentially all the important events in their lives and um, kind of helps them start to see in black and white what's happened to them. It also provides an opportunity to start to tie the symptoms that they're experiencing with the events that have occurred. So that kind of leads us into uh, psychoeducation and you know, I think sometimes the value of psychoeducation and spending some time doing this can be underestimated. Um, in my experience, I've seen a significant shift happen for a child and family when provided with information on trauma, the common symptoms, um, the impact on the brain. So first of all, it starts to normalize what can be at minimum very uncomfortable and oftentimes frightening sensations or thoughts and feelings in the aftermath of trauma. So when you can start to make the connection between the current problematic symptoms and behavior to the trauma, it helps the child and family begin to view that behavior in a different light. Um, you know, at one time those behaviors served a purpose and helped that child survive, but in, you know, different circumstances like school or out in the community, those same behaviors are seen as maladaptive and are negatively impacting their functioning. Um, it can also be helpful to educate parents and others about how trauma presents at different developmental stages um, because they might need help differentiating between what's trauma and what's normal child development. Um, so that can be useful. Um, I also spend time educating children and their families about the impact of trauma on the brain, um, especially around the fight, flight, and freeze response, and that when the brain is in that survival mode, um, executive functioning is compromised. So, you know, they're not as able to problem solve and plan and organize um, in those moments when they're in fight, flight, or freeze. So this helps, again, to normalize that experience and uh, help to kind of differentiate between when they're kind of activated and in survival mode. Um, like any of us, when we're receiving treatment for any condition, you know, we want to know what that treatment's going to look like and understand what it entails, what to expect, what are the potential negative outcomes, um, so you can make an informed decision about what you're about to embark on. So really take the time to explain that and answer questions. Um, lastly, um, the, as I mentioned before, it's important to provide education to collaterals um, so that, you know, for example, the school may need the child's behavior reframe to understand that, you know, he's being triggered and it's not that he's just deliberately having these outbursts and walking out of class, but that something has happened and he's having a kind of traumatic response. 
And so in general, I've found a little education about trauma and about the brain can go a long way in creating new understanding and uh, set the stage for intervention. Um, when it comes to skill development um, in children, I think we often forget that it's not as simple as just kind of following directions, like, you know, like a recipe to bake a cake or putting together some furniture. Um, so we can't just write out the steps and expect a child to get it. You know, so if you think back to a young child, an infant, they don't go straight from crawling to walking. We know that it's a process. There's repeated attempts. There's what can be deemed as failures until the to toddler is able to walk unassisted. So the same thing happens when we're developing and strengthening skills for a trauma survivor who probably has a very strong network um, when it comes to being in survival mode, but they haven't had a lot of practice and opportunity to build more adaptive skills. And we're going to really kind of dive into uh, this a little bit further. So when you look across evidence-based practices, you usually find these same set of skills that are identified. Um, and so I kind of grouped them into three categories, kind of those that fall under basic self-care, those in the distress reduction category, and then self-regulation. And again, not every child needs um, development in all areas. This is where your assessment's going to help you fine-tune your approach. But they do usually kind of follow a sequential approach um, and so kind of build upon each other. Um, so we start off kind of looking at um, self-care, and I find that this isn't always explicitly addressed in some treatment approaches, but I think it's really important because it's easy to overlook these, you know, kind of what we might think of as basics. Um, so during your assessment, once again, really asking questions about eating habits, exercise, sleep, um, time with technology versus socialization with peers, and then providing education on the importance of attending to self-care. Um, and you also should maybe be asking the questions of, of the caregiver as well, you know, thinking about kind of the oxygen mask approach. So, you know, when the airline attendant instructs us to put on our mask before we can assist others, how are parents doing in these areas? Um, and so, you know, if they're taking care of themselves, they'll be better able to support their child. They're also role modeling um, good self-care for their children. I find that sleep in particular is often disrupted for trauma survivors, so having difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, nightmares. And so, you know, getting that sleep routine regulated and getting and restoring a good night's sleep is really important because that's going to help that child in other areas as well. Um, we take a look at, uh, you know, kind of distress tolerance. Um, this, you know, obviously is important because following a trauma, it's not uncommon for someone to experience emotional flooding or flashbacks, um, be very hypervigilant, um, feel on edge, be more easily overwhelmed. And so both to cope in kind of day-to-day -day life and also eventually to be able to engage in trauma processing, which is going to happen a little bit further into the treatment process, the child's going to be able to need to strengthen their ability to tolerate and uh, reduce distress. So for immediate distress um, reduction, it's helpful to teach some grounding exercises. Um, these are often associated with DBT, so you can look there for more information. But um, you know, if a child becomes overwhelmed in session, it can be helpful just to start with some verbal reassurance and really just orient them, you know, where are, you know, that you're here in the office, you're with me, you're safe, um, just to kind of get them back into the present moment. Um, there's also some techniques that you can uh, teach children to help them consciously become aware of the sensory information that can help ground them to the present. So I do an exercise with kids where, you know, we focus on five things that they can see, five things they can hear, five things they can physically feel, and then we do a countdown, four are things, three things, two, and one. And by the time you get to one, they're usually back in the here and now. Um, and that's something that they can take with them outside of the office too, so it's a really good tool. Um, relaxation exercises um, also helps the child to learn how to reduce arousal. So again, here's an opportunity for some psychoeducation because usually, you know, you talk to a kid and they say, oh, they tell me to take deep breaths or, you know, to breathe, and that doesn't help. But really taking the time to educate them on 
the power that they actually have by being able to consciously regulate their breath and that they're actually re-regulating their central nervous system when they do that, um, that gives a whole new perspective on breathing. And so there's multiple practices you can teach them for younger children. You might do soft belly breathing. You know, I have them lie on the floor and take a stuffed animal and they can kind of give their breathing buddy a ride. Um, there's this 4462 count, which I use with um, adolescents. They find helpful because it gives them a focus. So it's four breaths in, pause for four, six breaths out, and pause for two. Um, coherent breathing, I would refer you to that reference. Um, that can be a very good tool. Some kids um, prefer something um, that's a little uh, maybe less touchy-feely, and so progressive muscle relaxation can be helpful where they're focusing on different muscle groups. Um, I also have them try out guided visualization. So, you know, people like different things and feel comfortable with different things, so kind of have them sample and try out what works for them. Um, mindfulness also has many potential benefits for youth with trauma histories. Um, so through developing mindful skills, people are building their capacity to be aware of their experience. And so trauma survivors who tend to get stuck kind of in the past, past memories, or start worrying about the future events, mindfulness can be a key skill to learn how to stay present, um, how to stay in the here and now. So that can lead to greater capacity to let go of upsetting thoughts, feelings, and memories. And, um, you know, if I learn how to stay present, then I'm going to be better able to tune in when I start to feel anxious and be able to recognize those signs that I'm starting to get triggered and then be able to utilize plans that I'm going to develop versus, you know, kind of reacting and getting dysregulated. Um, similarly, emotional pain can uh, be re-triggering uh, and can send people into that fight-flight response. So mindfulness can help the, the survivor experience that they can stay with and be able to actually tolerate that emotional pain um, and so not to get so overwhelmed uh, when that comes up. Um, there's a lot of different mindfulness exercises that can be found. Um, there's this reference here for the integrative treatment of complex trauma for adolescents that has some examples. Also the uh, ARC model, which is at the end of the presentation, and uh, through uh, DBT also has examples of that. Um, so once the child's learned and built some distress tolerance, you can start to move into self-regulation. And like all abilities, um, self-regulation has a developmental progression. So if you think back, um, you know, if you have uh, young children or have been around young children, um, initially regulation is ex external. So, you know, a parent who soothes their crying child or as they get older, they start to name the, the states that their child's in. You look like you're getting sleepy or you look sad. Um, so that happens, um, you know, externally, but over time, regulation um, develop and develops and it becomes something that uh, someone's able to do for themselves. For traumatized children, they might not have had that consistent caregiver who um, was, you know, kind of demonstrating those behaviors to help them develop self-regulation skills. Um, and because these abilities weren't modeled and developed, these traumatized children are more prone to become uh, more easily dysregulated. And it can either look like the kids who become very out of control or on the other end of the spectrum, those that are overly rigid and overly controlled. And some kids go both ways. So either way, these kids are really um, challenged to be flexible and adaptive in the face of stress. And so this is where kind of developing these self-regulation skills um, are going to help them develop that ability to become more flexible. So the first component of uh, the self-regulation is uh, looking at affect modulation. So children with trauma histories often struggle with regulating their emotional states, as I said, and can um, you know, become easily dysregulated but might not even have a language to adequately describe their internal experience. Um, so your assessment will really help to pinpoint where any given child is developmentally and where they might need some additional skill strengthening. 
So for many children, this is starting with building a feeling, uh, building a feeling vocabulary. So um, you know, we know for a lot of these kids, if they're able to identify any feeling, it's usually anger um, or maybe saying that they just feel bad. Um, so they need assistance in both discriminating the range of feelings and also the degree of intensity of those feelings. So feeling vocabulary can be built in a number of ways through feeling posters, cards, um, drawing different feelings and emotions. Um, and then from there, it can actually be helpful to practice physically trying on, so to speak, different emotions. So like, what does it feel like? What does it look like when someone's, you know, when you're mad? And where do you feel that in your body? And so um, really getting them to kind of experience those feelings. And um, then from there, introducing different degrees of emotions. Um, and many of the evidence-based practices use some form of like a feeling thermometer. So starting from zero and going from 10 to 10, um, kind of what do those look like? And having the child describe each end of the scale and then kind of filling in the middle. So you can use numbers, you can use colors, anything that's going to help them discriminate um, those different kind of uh, feeling states. Um, this also helps to create the language that you're going to use in session around the children's emotional state and um, being able to then monitor that state throughout treatment. So once a child's developed that vocabulary, the next step is being able to share those feelings with others. That's that affect expression. So this might be a new experience for a child who's previously primarily expressed their emotion through behavior and may not have models about how to talk about feelings and then even have this met with any sort of empathy or understanding. So this is going to be practiced within the therapeutic relationship and also um, within the child and caregiver relationship, but that might require and need some coaching. So this part um, and phase of treatment, there's a lot of rehearsal and role playing that can occur to help develop the skill. Um, I was recently um, got an important reminder from an 11-year-old boy that I work with about kind of, again, the assessment piece of where someone's at. So I wasn't his first therapist. Um, he'd worked with other professionals. And so, of course, when I started to meet with him, I was kind of assessing his ability to identify feelings and emotions. And what he said to me is, I know how to name my feelings. I just don't know what to do with them. And again, this just was a reminder to me that we really need to do that good assessment because if I spend all my time with him trying to get him to name his feelings, um, he's going to get disengaged from the treatment process. So I really need to assess what is he looking for, what does he need, um, and focus on that and developing those skills. Um, the next component uh, found in evidence-based practices um, and when we're looking at self-regulation is to address the cognitions. So we know that uh, trauma survivors um, often have well-rehearsed patterns of negative thinking based on their experience. And so, you know, these tapes kind of play in the background, you know, such as it's this is all my fault, I'm worthless, I can't depend on anyone. And the youth may not even be aware that these thoughts are there. So bringing these thoughts to awareness and then helping them make the connection between these thoughts and their feelings and subsequent behaviors can help to lessen the impact of these cognitions. Um, so the next step after they kind of understand that relationship is then helping them to challenge and replace the unhelpful thoughts with more adaptive ones, you know, such as, I did my best, um, I can handle this. So this is where you're developing their internal um, self-talk. So this is an example from an eight-year-old girl um, that I was working with who uh, witnessed some uh, significant domestic violence in her home. Her father was no longer living there, and uh, there was, in fact, a restraining order and, and such in place. So she had a lot of trouble with sleep and also experienced a lot of anxiety out in public. So um, what we did is, you know, kind of introduced and did a little education about the connection between thoughts, feelings, and, and behaviors, or here it's written actions, and then walked through a couple scenarios with her. So the first one was kind of she heard a noise at night, and the scary thought was dad's at the door, and then she would feel worried, and uh, the action would be that she would go press the safety button in the home and tell her mom. So then we started to think about, well, what else could it be? Is there other possibilities? So she came up with, well, it could be a tree banging at the window. If that's what it was, I'd feel fine and go back to bed. 
The other scenario we went um, through was uh, being out in the community. So uh, worrying that she might see dad at the blockbuster near her house and that, um, you know, that would make her feel um, nervous and uh, she would want to stay close to her mom. Um, and again, we kind of walked through um, what could you think that might be more helpful. And uh, she said, you know, that's unlikely that I'm going to see him. And if I thought that, I'd feel okay and, and play with my brother. So um, we started to make those connections between how she felt and how she feels, um, how, what she thought, what she felt, and then how she behaved. And this can really increase her sense of power because if I can change my thinking, and then I can change how I feel. Um, in terms of feelings, um, one thing I didn't do in this example that I just wanted to highlight is actually have her rate the intensity of those feelings on a scale from one to zero because the reality is sometimes changing the thought isn't going to make the anxiety and worry go away entirely, but if you can reduce the intensity of that feeling, it makes it that there's more likelihood for it to be managed and uh, lead to different behaviors. So um, just a couple of tips in terms of effective skill development. Um, you know, I think this picture really reminds us, this picture and image of the butterflies, you know, that you can't force caterpillars to turn into butterflies. There's a developmental process, and even once the transformation happens, the butterfly can't immediately fly off. It has to learn how to use its wings. And it's similar when you're doing skill development. So while, you know, the goal might be to self-regulate, the first step is to recognize uh, kind of that feeling inside my body. Um, so if the steps are achievable, the child's going to feel a sense of success and self-efficacy, and that's going to help with that next step. Also, you know, there's going to be a lot of need to practice repeatedly. I always remind children and families to practice new skills when they're not feeling stressed. Don't try them out in problem situations at first. They have to build their comfort and confidence in using them so that when they are needed to use them under stress, they're going to be able to do that. And just encouraging and reminding them to be patient with themselves. You know, change takes time, and even if a child has a initial success, um, they might not be consistent at first, so really having realistic expectations around that skill development. Um, the next phase of treatment is the trauma processing. Um, so humans by nature are, we're storytelling creatures, that's really how we make sense of our world, and trauma is an experience of real disintegration and fragmentation. So the trauma processing is an essential component to recovery from trauma because it allows the child to explore and integrate that traumatic memory and the thoughts and the feelings and the sensory experiences into a narrative that um, makes sense and is um, cohesive. So this can occur through various mechanisms, um, including play for younger children. So initially their play might be very repetitive and they might be reenacting the trauma. Um, and, uh, you know, but the continued play with, uh, can allow them to start to do the processing. For older children, creating a written or symbolic narrative, um, similar to what's done through trauma-focused CBT, um, can be beneficial. So some children really like that book format. Others might like something um, that's more that allows them to express their creativity through poetry or songwriting. Um, imagery or exposure through imagery uh, can be another technique where they are gradually exposed to and repeat, uh, repeatedly to the traumatic event. So all of these techniques allow the child to, again, to build that narrative around the emotions and the actions and cognitions um, in relation to those traumatic memories. And then, again, with the purpose of incorporating it into a more coherent and also realistic um, narrative of who they are and their relation to others. As the story unfolds and is revisited, there's opportunity to examine and resolve um, the strong emotions often associated with the story and um, any kind of cognitive uh, distortions. Um, Blaustein and Kinnenberg in their ARC model, I think, offer this very helpful stepwise approach to what they refer to as trauma experience integration, which is just another term for trauma processing. 
So as you're preparing for trauma processing, it's important to first check in with the child to assess their current state. What's their mood? And uh, using something like a SUDS rating. So, you know, kind of I feel anxious, um, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm at a 5. Um, so this is important because while we might expect a child to feel some anxiety as they go through this process, you also want to make sure the child's not on the verge of experiencing like a panic attack. Um, Secondly, the child should be clearly empowered to set the pace, so explicitly letting them know that, um, you know, they get to decide how much material is covered and at what depth. And it will probably take several sessions for the story to be told in its entirety. And as you review the story, there's opportunity to expand and go deeper, and again, with the purpose of gradual exposure to the material. So this leads to step three, where the work um, occurs to really start to connect those feelings, those thoughts and beliefs that are associated with the trauma. And often there's cognitive distortions like around things around responsibility um, or feelings of shame that can then be explored and uh, gently challenged as needed. And at, throughout this whole process, again, coming back to and checking in with the child around um, kind of where are they at emotionally, what's their rating, is it going up, is it coming down, um, so that you make sure they're staying in the moment because if they get so dysregulated that they're kind of checking out, they're not going to be able to do that trauma processing. And then the last step is really making meaning. So kind of through this experience that they've been through, how might it kind of shape their, their vision and making sense of who they are and um, what's important to them in the world. Um, and, you know, for younger children, you can ask something like, what would you tell other kids who are going through something similar? So really just get them to see this in a, in a, new, in a new way. So this is an example of a... Um, symbolic trauma narrative that a girl completed who had a history of complex trauma. And um, as you can see, she's, she's quite artistic. And so for her, because there was multiple events with multiple perpetrators, she did this kind of graphic timeline to tell her story. And uh, the image on the left is uh, capturing kind of the verbal abuse that she endured. And then the one on the right uh, is looking at the impact of alcohol and substance abuse in the family. So what we are able to do is use these images and then move into a verbal narrative to facilitate integration and um, making meaning. So in this final section, um, I really want to get into, okay, so how do you put these together, the phases of treatment with the core components in order to uh, make sure you're providing effective treatment for an individual child in a uh, family? So Effective trauma treatment is going to be dependent on ongoing monitoring of treatment outcomes. Um, so you can have a great treatment plan written, but unless that treatment plan becomes a living document that's regularly monitored, um, you're not going to maybe make the full treatment gains that you could and uh, make the adjustments that are needed to, to make those achievements. Um, so, you know, obviously you start with your initial plan and um, based on your assessment, and that's going to help you prioritize uh, where to start and focus. Um, the CPSS, that tool I showed earlier, is also a good way to measure symptom, symptom reduction and, you know, looking both for reductions in the frequency of those symptoms and also its impact on functioning. So you would expect as new skills are being learned that you'd see reductions in both of those areas. If not, it's a really good opportunity to examine your approach and make necessary modifications. So maybe the child didn't master a skill that you thought that they did, so you got to go back and do more work in that area. Or maybe there's been a recent crisis in the family that needs to be addressed, and you're going to put kind of the treatment you're doing on hold um, until that's their stabilization again. So this really helps to inform the pacing of treatment and when a child's ready to move into uh, trauma processing as well. Um, and this is really important because to do this kind of checking and monitoring because I've been aware of situations when a child kind of stays in therapy for a long time and they kind of get stuck in that skill development phase. And sometimes, like as I said before, there's valid reason for it um, because they don't have the out external support that might not be appropriate for them to gauge in that trauma processing. 
but sometimes um, we have to be honest and it's due to our own reluctance to kind of go there and open up some really painful areas for a child. So we have to be mindful of where we're at as well and what our own issues might be that's affecting treatment pro um, progress. Um, so along those lines, it's important to get the f um, both formal and informal feedback from a child and family. Is treatment meeting their expectations? What's going well? Um, what would they like to be different? Um, so this is really um, helping to kind of continue to build that treatment relationship that's built on trust and collaboration and a sense of um, empowerment. Um, it goes without saying that caregiver involvement is important from day one. Um, so, you know, the progress that's made in treatment can start in session but really takes place outside of the office. And the caregiver is going to play a critical role in helping that child practice and generalize new skills at home, um, out in the community. And in order to be well prepared for that role, the caregiver needs to really have a solid understanding of what the child's learning and how they can be of support. So oftentimes, you know, I invite the parent into the session um, where we'll review what's been um, taught, new skills, have the child maybe model that or even teach it to their parent so that they have a really good understanding and we talk about when, it, when can the child practice those skills, how are we going to monitor those skills. Um, so that's really, really um, critical. Also, the caregiver often has uh, questions about parenting following trauma. You know, should I have the same expectations? Um, when do I set limits? When do I let things go? So the caregiver really needs important understanding of uh, the importance of maintaining high expectations, um, setting appropriate limits, and at the same time being flexible and being able to make short-term modifications um, as needed. So, you know, for example, if there's a child who um, is uh, struggling at bedtime and keeps coming into their room at night and wants to get into bed with the, with the caregivers, you know, there might be a short time that the parents are making that modification with the eventual goal of getting that child back in their own room in their own bed. I also just want to note the importance of assessing and encouraging caregivers um, to, to uh, look at their own needs around treatment. They might have been, uh, you know, kind of directly impacted by the trauma themselves or certainly um, the aftermath. Um, they might have their own personal history of trauma, which could be re-triggered. So in order for them to kind of maintain that stable, caring environment, again, going back to making sure that they're taking care of themselves. Um, as a child's progressing towards the end of treatment, um, it's important to consolidate those treatment gains and plan ahead about how they're going to apply the new skills to future events. So part of this work is helping that child start to be able to anticipate triggers and plan for how they're going to respond to them. Um, but we all know that sometimes people can be triggered um, when they're not anticipating it. It's, you know, it's just a different situation. So having them be able to um, have early recognition of their trigger symptoms and kind of almost have an emergency plan on them. So, you know, who are the people they can call? Where are the safe places they can go? What are the techniques that they have that can help ground them in the moment? And maybe even carrying this with them on a card can be really useful. Another core component is planning for personal safety. So the trauma survivor, you know, we know they tend to either over or underestimate risk in given situations. For those who underestimate risk, they might end up making choices that could place them in high-risk situations, um, ultimately making them more vulnerable for additional trauma. So, you know, unfortunately, I've worked with um, a few adolescent girls who have trauma histories and, you know, like adolescents do, goes to parties, use maybe uh, drugs and alcohol, and then have gotten into uh, situations with a boy and, you know, one of these girls actually ended up getting raped. So now she has a subsequent trauma on top of kind of uh, what initially kind of brought her into care. So it's really important to brainstorm potentially risky situations and then taking precautions. Um, you know, what can they do? And doing that planning proactively. We know for any adolescent, um, you know, that's kind of difficult for them to do. Their brain's still developing. So really practicing and thinking about good decision making and like any skill, practicing that in session, like visualizing it, rehearsing it, role playing it so that they're able to practice um, and use that in real life. 
Um, so after treatment gains have been achieved and maintained, um, it's time to move towards uh, discharge. And as you're leading up to this point, it's helpful to start reviewing the progress that's been made. So usually I find that children will present with situations that would you would originally have been very challenging for them, but they're now able to master. So taking time to reflect on that, like, wow, how did you do that? What, what did you do differently? And getting them to really think about that and making that more conscious can be really helpful because you're, um, you know, highlighting those new skills that they have. Um, I also set the stage uh, that, you know, that they can come back if needed or at least check in. Um, you know, loss um, it can be a trigger for trauma survivors and goodbyes can be difficult. So um, sometimes just being able to know they can pick up the phone and call um, can be helpful. Um, other times, you know, there might be a need for some booster sessions. And I prepare families for this in terms of the fact that developmentally, as children um, reach new milestones, there might be other parts of the work that they might have to come back or revisit and that that's uh, normal and doesn't mean that they're kind of backsliding. Um, as we conclude this afternoon, I do want to just share kind of a story of uh, real post-traumatic growth uh, that I uh, experienced with a 13-year-old girl who I worked with. Um, she had a neighbor who was uh, murdered in a domestic violence-related incident and following the event, she experienced nightmares, intrusive thoughts, um, didn't want to go spend time with friends, um, which was very hard for her because she was a very social girl. So she worked really hard in therapy and we made um, significant progress um, with her ability to manage her, system, her symptoms. And then several months uh, after discharge, um, there was a line of duty death in her community and the officer who died was also a family friend. So this was a second loss um, for her in a relatively short period of time. And so her mom called me and, uh, you know, was concerned obviously that this might be a setback for her daughter and we decided to kind of take a wait and see approach. And what ended up happening is that um, because she kind of felt empowered through processing the um, first trauma, she actually felt empowered um, and ended up writing a letter to the governor um, requesting tighter gun control because both of the, the incidents were involved uh, handguns. And so, um, you know, it just was a really good reminder to me that while we wish that these children are never going to experience another trauma in their life, that's not always the case, but what we can hope for is that they've built resiliency to better weather, you know, future storms that they're going to encounter. So on that note, um, and in the remaining time we had, I wanted to take any thoughts or uh, questions that um, people might have. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks for such a great presentation. You really did a great job of taking us through the phases of trauma treatment, the core components of effective treatment, and then, again, helping us to put it all together. So thank you so much for this. We do have one question from Karen. She works on an inpatient psych unit, and she's wondering about the best way to take um, parts of this to train therapy aids. Um, yeah, I think especially kind of some of the distress tolerance um, activities, so the relaxation techniques, the breathing techniques um, can be taught to aids and, um, you know, they can be uh, helpful in kind of teaching and reminding uh, children who are on the unit to use them. And frankly, you know, kind of an inpatient unit can be a high stress situation anyway, so staff having those skills and being able to use them if you're thinking of a trauma-informed approach can uh, really be beneficial for everyone and then they're going to be better able to help model and coach that for uh, the kids on the unit. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Amanda is wondering if there are any handouts or resources we could refer to. So I'll let you know, Amanda, that there um, the assessment that, that Dr. Meeker presented, we're going to have on our website. Um, I don't know of any other handouts or resources. There's a resource page here uh, where she's list, uh, Dr. Meeker listed a bunch of resources that you can refer to when this is posted on our website. Is there anything else that you want to add, Elizabeth? Um, no, I think that covers it. So the, the ones that are listed, um, you know, there's ones that look at the different assessment tools that are available. But if you look at those different treatment protocols, they have really good examples of, you know, 
um, different ones of like these, uh, the meditations or mindfulness exercises, um, the affect modulation, like so you can kind of look through these and kind of get some concrete examples of things that you might be able to use in session. Great. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to move the slides to show your reference page? Oh, sure. Thanks for the reminder. So here's the reference page. So the first two there have the, um, looking at the links to the database. And, um, oh, I'm seeing, you know what, Kara, I didn't actually send you my updated reference page, so I can send that to you so that people can have the full references because I added a few more. Okay, great. Great. So we'll put those on the slides before we post them. Yeah. So as a reminder, the slides will be available um, on our website probably by tomorrow, along with the recording of the webinar. These are upcoming CTEC events. I do not know what happened when this uploaded. <laughs> That's Dr. Bruce Perry. He's going to be with us on January 29th um, from 12 to 1. He's a renowned expert on trauma, and we're really excited to have him present. He's been on Oprah. He's been on uh, lots of television networks and, and has published and he's been at the National Council Conferences, so he's very well known, and we're really lucky to have him present 12 to 1 on January 29th. And I think that concludes our webinar today. Here's some contact information. Uh, do you want to show me your contact information, Elizabeth? Yep. In case anybody wants to contact you or you can reach out to me. And then if you can go to the next slide. Um, if you, If anyone listening has any ideas or requests for topics to cover in our Clinical Lunch and Learn webinar series, please email me because we would love to have them. My email actually is kara.dean at nyu.edu. Um, we'd love to uh, get your feedback on any kind of topics that you'd want us to cover. We, this concludes our webinar. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again to you, Dr. Meeker, and we will talk to you all soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.